Do you want to get started, Sheena? Yeah, I think that'd be a great idea. So um, Mona will do introductions and then I will be um, moderator, so. Okay, um, well, welcome uh, virtually to the Institute for Middle East Studies at George Washington University. Uh, my name is Mona Atia. I'm the director of the Institute. And we're delighted to uh, have here today Arbella Bet Shilmon um, in conversation with Sarah Persley um, discussing uh, the book City of Black Gold. So um, I will be introducing our speakers. Dr. Bet Shilmon is Associate Professor of History at the University of Washington. She's a historian of the modern Middle East focused on urban history and she's affiliated with the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations, as well as the Jackson School um, at UW. Her research and teaching focuses on the politics, society, and economy of 20th century Iraq and the broader Persian Gulf region. She's going to be speaking today with Sarah Persley about her book, City of Black Gold, Oil, Ethnicity, and the Making of Modern Kirku, um, which was published by Stanford University Press uh, last year and explores how oil and urbanization made ethnicity into a political practice in Kirkuk. And our second uh, speaker is Sarah Persley. Um, she's assistant professor of Middle Eastern and Islamic studies at New York University, where she works on cultural, social, and intellectual history of the modern Arab Middle East, mainly in Iraq. She studies how experiences of time, space, and selfhood were reordered in the region during the 20th century, especially at the dawn of the global age of development around World War II. Um, we're particularly excited about this event, uh, given that we had scheduled it previously and we had to reschedule it, and to be able to hold it um, as our first virtual event of the summer. Um, and we're very excited about the format. So thank you all for joining us. Um, Associate Director Shana Marshall is going to be um, hosting today's program, and we expect it to run about one hour. So thanks for joining us, Shana. Great, um, yes, thanks everyone so much. Um, so just in terms of logistics, um, I'm Shana Marshall, I'm the Associate Director of the Institute. Um, everyone, all of the guests are muted. Um, the only people who are unmuted are the speakers. Um, so if you have a question, um, please type it into the chat box, um, which you will have access to if you uh, hover your computer cursor uh, near the bottom of the screen in the very center, there's a option called chat. Um, you can send your question to me privately. Um, I am Institute for Middle East Studies um, co-host, or you can send it to the general audience if you want everyone to see your question. Um, depending on how many questions we get, uh, I will either uh, put all the questions to our guests uh, or um, I'll have to sort of choose and curate which questions um, make it into the discussion. Uh, so we'll go about 30 minutes, 35 minutes of the sort of formal uh, discussion between um, Arbella and Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, and then we'll move on to open uh, Q&A with the general audience. Thanks so much for joining us. And uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, you can hear me, right? Yes. Perfect. Good. Okay. Um, so thank you all for joining us on this online event and um, thank you for finding a way to make it work. I'm so disappointed I had to cancel my trip to DC, but this is, you know, um, at, at the very least, this allows people not in DC to, to attend. And so that's the silver lining here, I guess. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, so just to jump right in, some remarks to introduce you to this book. Um, so the book is about Kirkuk. Kirkuk is Iraq's fourth to sixth largest city, depending on what estimate you look at, with a population that's less than a million. So it's provincial, and on the ground, it doesn't look especially remarkable. And yet it's the subject of an impassioned territorial dispute that millions of people have very strong opinions about. Virtually every Iraqi, most every Kurdish person, much of the population of Turkey and many others. So it's a city in crisis, politically stagnant and ethnically segregated. And for decades, its residents have had to contend with a constant war of words and episodic violence over the city's status. After the 2003 overthrow of the Iraqi Ba'ath regime, the disputes over Kirkuk's future held up all sorts of parliamentary discussions and even delayed elections. Iraqi lawmakers and foreign policymakers have spent the years since then attempting to address the urgent need to resolve rival claims to control Kirkuk and rival claims to the city's identity. And I'll get into the dimensions of that dispute in a moment, but first let's touch on the reasons for the dispute. 
And here I'm going to go ahead and move to the next PowerPoint slide if I can find a way to do that. Um, so I'm not sure why that's not work. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. So, uh, but first I, I'd like to touch on the reasons for the dispute, as I said. So why does this mid-sized city in Iraq matter to so many people, right? And why did I write a whole book about it? The simplest answer to this question is oil. After all, the city rests atop a supergiant oil field. Kirkuk was the first place oil was discovered in Iraq, and for decades, it was the heart of the country's oil industry. And Baghdad went to great lengths to integrate this majority non-Arab area into mostly Arab Iraq. You would be hard pressed to find a discussion of Kirkuk's political crisis since 2003 that does not contain the modifier oil rich to describe the city. The oil rich city of Kirkuk is disputed, usually in the headline. But the idea of oil as a cause of Kirkuk's ethnic conflict is seldom explored in any greater detail. So one of the central questions of my work is what does it mean really for a dispute to be about oil? Kirkuk's conflict is not only about oil in the simplistic sense that Kirkukis have no stakes in other forms of control and legitimacy. So we often use the notion that a dispute is about a resource to suggest that it's not about other things that are more pure and genuine. So for example, Bush didn't invade Iraq to give it democracy, he invaded it for the oil, right? But claims to Kirkuk's history and culture are a powerful factor in the dispute that cannot be dismissed as a flimsy pretense fabricated post hoc to justify a desire to control oil. In other words, the dispute over Kirkuk is also a competition for historical memory. Kirkuk is one of the most multilingual cities of its size in the Middle East. And sites like these signs with three or four, or even five languages on them are common. Its culture is diverse and syncretic. But communities within the city and outside of it have their own narratives of its history, and it's significant that they tell these narratives in strongly ethnic ways. That is, a person's ethnic identity is a strong predictive factor of how they characterize Kirkuk. So Kurds tend to claim that Kirkuk has always been a Kurdish city and that they have been fighting to restore it to its rightful status as a Kurdish city for an undefined but presumably very long period of time. Turkmens, who are native speakers of a Turkish dialect prevalent in northern Iraq, usually claim that Kirkuk is rightfully a Turkmen city and that its Turkmen character has been altered by force since the end of the Ottoman Empire. They see themselves as marginalized within their own ancestral capital. And then there are members of other less numerous ethnic groups who are mostly Arabs, but there are also Assyrians and other small indigenous groups. These groups typically stress the view that Kirkuk has always been a microcosm of Iraq's diversity, and therefore it is rightfully an Iraqi city. And here the word Iraqi encompasses something pluralistic and non-sectarian, right? The, the people who belong to the numerously, numer numerically less dominant groups are, are less likely to claim that it belongs to a single ethnic group and want to, to claim that it's you know, Iraqi. So the prevailing understanding of Kirkuk, despite being in some senses all about history, is very ahistorical because it tends to assume these ethnic groups have always been there and always had the same interests. But ethnolinguistic identity is a process and a phenomenon that is in flux. For example, ethnicity can go from an insignificant background fact about a population to the dividing line in an altercation quite suddenly. And this is true everywhere, not just in Kirkuk. And ethnic terms in Kirkuk were not constant in definition, nor were they sites of political mobilization or the cleavage lines in a territorial status dispute until pretty recently. So Kirkuk is a disputed city with a diverse population, and there are many others in the world like it. A historical view of how identities become politicized in a place like Kirkuk gives us a fuller understanding of how local politics can become organized around these sorts of claims. And importantly, ethnicity is not only a concern of political and intellectual history. In urban history, economic, societal, and intellectual trends are tightly bound together. So how did ethnic identities in Kirkuk develop into these, this institutionalized Kurdish Arab Turkmen schema that's so familiar to people there today? And how did those ethnicities become politically salient? That question brings us back to oil. So in this book, I argue that in 20th century Kirkuk, oil, urbanization, and colonialism guided the processes of nation building and collective identity formation. And the city that these forces built gave rise to fragmented contentious local politics. 
ethnicity as a concept developed and hardened because the oil industry interacted with local economic and social fault lines, while intertwined with Baghdad's nation building policies and the British colonial presence. As Kirkuk grew, its inhabitants' interests increasingly became determined by whether they belonged to this or that linguistic or ethnic group. Before urbanization and before the discovery of oil, these communal identities hadn't mattered as much. The Iraqi state was established as a League of Nations mandate under British control in 1920, with Kirkuk provisionally part of its de facto territory. Kirkuk was a mostly Turkish-speaking city in a region surrounded mostly by Arabic speakers to the southwest and Kurdish speakers to the northeast. After the end of World War I, Kirkuk ended up in a region disputed between British Iraq and the newly formed Republic of Turkey. And this map is from the League of Nations mediation that followed that. Throughout that period of international conflict, Kirkukis chose sides based on which entity best served their interests. And those stances sometimes aligned in expected ways with self-identity. So for instance, many of Kirkuk's Turkish-speaking elites had close ties in Turkey, and so they wanted to be part of the new Turkish Republic. But this was inconsistent and unpredictable, which was something that the European League of Nations mediators found confusing and vexing. They wanted to find ethnic nationalist loyalties in Kirkuk to help them resolve the dispute, and they openly expressed frustration that they couldn't. The formal granting of Kirkuk to Iraq paved the way for an oil concession to the Iraq Petroleum Company, which I'll refer to here as the IPC. Despite having Iraq in its name, it was a British registered company jointly owned by British, French, American, and Dutch interests. And the IPC concession gave it a monopoly for developing Iraqi oil fields. Drillers struck oil just northwest of Kirkuk in 1927. It soon became clear that the city was resting on a massive oil field, larger than anyone had anticipated, and that's when Kirkuk's profound transformation began. The IPC's presence permanently changed Kirkuk's urban fabric and demographic composition. This set of maps gives you that contrast between the pre-oil 1919, sort of what it looked like at the end of the Ottoman era versus what it looked like by the 1950s. By the 1950s, Kirkuk's population had multiplied nearly five times and almost half of the city's inhabitants were directly or indirectly reliant on the oil company for their livelihood. In other words, they were either oil workers or their families. If you were walking around Kirkuk at that time, the thoroughfares were now being paved with asphalt derived from local oil. Even dirt roads, like the one that you see in this photo, were sprayed down with bitumen, which is an oil byproduct, to keep them from getting muddy after rainfall. And the spoken languages you heard in the streets were changing. People who spoke Turkish as their first language were now no longer a majority of the urban population. The Kurdish and Arab populations were growing rapidly with new immigrants. Another change was that the usage of Arabic was rising in the city. This was largely because of Baghdad's ongoing effort to promote Arabic language primary and secondary education in non-Arab areas of Iraq. The official Arabic curriculum may have been a nation building measure, but it proved to be divisive in Kirkuk, where educating the mostly non-Arab students solely in Arabic was very controversial. In the course of this project, I interviewed an Assyrian who was a child in Kirkuk in this era. He grew up to be a linguist and, and worked as a linguistics professor for many years. Um, for those who might be familiar, his name is Edward Odisho. Um, so he, he cares a lot about language. And he told me that his elementary school teachers would often just teach classes in Turkish rather than Arabic when they knew that everyone in the room knew Turkish. So Baghdad's influence and growing political consciousness and growing tensions in Kirkuk combined in a labor strike in the oil company in 1946. And the aftermath of that strike would shape the city's political and economic trajectory for over a decade. The Iraqi Communist Party based in Baghdad sent operatives to Kirkuk to seek work with the oil company and organize the workers. And the organized workers then called a strike of the IPC's Iraqi workforce. That strike was undergirded by longstanding grievances of daily wage workers about their poor working conditions. The strike continued for a couple of weeks while the company didn't budge, and it then came to a disastrous end when Kirkuk's police fired on the protesters and killed several of them on the orders of the provincial governor and British officials. This strike and its terrible end alarmed the British and Iraqi establishments. They knew Kirkukis were turning against them. 
So it was a watershed moment that prompted the British government, the Iraqi government, and the IPC itself to pursue urban development projects to preserve their political position in the city. These development projects included the building of urban infrastructure like modern water and electricity systems. The IPC had the technology and capital to lead these projects. The IPC also expanded Kirkuk's urban fabric through housing schemes for its employees. Later, Iraqi government housing schemes were modeled after the IPC ones. The areas of construction were part of a trend of urban expansion toward the Northwest, where the oil fields were. And the largest of these schemes was the Aratha estate in the Northwestern part of the city, a housing estate for oil company workers. Um, so this is the, the 1950s map again. You can see Arafa indicated in the Northwest beyond the railway line. This is um, the oil company estate. And this is what Arafa looked like from the ground. The, these housing schemes privileged certain workers and focused on building in certain neighborhoods, which was part of a trend of steadily increasing inequality and urban segregation. At the same time that the city became more segregated, popular discourse promoted a civic identity for Kirkuk. Development projects were bolstered with prominent celebrations of Kirkuk's newfound oil modernity, and Kirkuk came to be known in these texts and films as the city of black gold. These discourses coincided with a rise in literacy and expansion of Kirkuk's literary culture, including the building of both public and private libraries and bookstores. Books about Kirkuk published by Iraqi presses began to come out in the 1940s and 1950s that discussed it as a discrete arena of history, economy, and culture. They, they created taxonomies of Kirkukis, divide dividing them by ethnicity and by tribe. And so this is the point where we increasingly start to see the use of words meaning nationality or race or people to describe Kirkuk's linguistic communities. These words would eventually be translated into English as ethnicity which was an increasingly solidifying concept, both in English and in these languages where all these words were um, loosely translated as ethnicity. These discourses also emphasized the transformative power of oil. So for instance, what you see on this slide is an excerpt of one of these books that was about Kirkuk, um, published in 1957. And on the right, you see a photo of a man standing in front of his new house built under an IPC housing scheme. The caption to this photo in the original book describes him as, quote, looking at his future with confidence and peace of mind after building a modern nest for his children. So by the late 1950s, Kirkuk had a clear identity as the city of black gold and a distinct domain of local politics. In the aftermath of Iraq's 1958 revolution, which overthrew the monarchy, this political domain became an arena in which the city's communities competed for authority. After 1958, the polarized and unstable politics of the revolution interacted with volatile local dynamics in Kirkuk in deadly ways, pitting the city's ethnic communities against one another in a way yet unknown in its modern history. Remember that non-sectarian communism had managed to briefly take hold among Kirkuki workers in the 1940s, just a decade earlier, overshadowing other political trends that revolved around ethnic identities. But those kinds of ideologies had since become subsumed under the rubrics of ethnic nationalisms in Kirkuk. Turkmens were historically the city's elites, while Kurds were more likely to be poorer recent migrants from the countryside who organized under the communist party. Also, the Kurdish national movement began to claim Kirkuk as part of Kurdish territory for the first time while aligned with the communists. The Iraqi Communist Party was the most popular party in Iraq immediately after the 58 revolution, and its ascent contributed to a sense among Kirkuki Turkmens that they were being sidelined within their own city. So a vicious conflict between increasingly unitary Kurdish and Turkmen communities emerged, bolstered by these differing class and political affiliations. The single worst episode of intercommunal violence in revolutionary Kirkuk occurred in July 1959 on the first anniversary of the coup and fueled a cycle of attacks and counterattacks that continued well into the 1960s. These terrible events began when Kurdish affiliates of the Communist Party decided to demonstrate in the center of Kirkuk as a defiant show of their strength in the city. Turkmen's planned their own demonstration for the same day in response, and this map shows the path that both processions took. Something caused the Kurdish demonstrators to attack a Turkmen-owned coffee shop. They destroyed it and killed the owner. 
A fight between the demonstrators followed and the Turkmens were overwhelmed by the armed Kurds. The Turkmens were not carrying firearms. They attacked houses in the citadel and destroyed many more buildings. And these attacks continued for two days until government reinforcements restored order. In the end, at least 31 people had been killed and 130 injured, likely more. The overwhelming majority of casualties were Turkmens and 24 out of the 28 perpetrators of the attacks who were eventually convicted were Kurds. A public statement by a group of prominent Turkmens in the immediate aftermath of the attack characterized it as, in their words, a genocidal war against the Turkmen race. And so with these events, the strongest forces in Kirkuk's politics had shifted into discrete and mutually hostile ethnic categories. The new forces prioritized control over the city of Kirkuk itself, politically, historically, and symbolically as a crucial political domain. More so than at any prior time in Iraq's modern history, Kirkuk's interests after 1958 came to depend on their ethnic identity and subjectivity. The revolutionary era also brought to power governments in Iraq that were increasingly authoritarian. Baghdad's previously subtle efforts to promote Arab dominance in Kirkuk turned into outright ethnic cleansing in the 1960s. In 1968, a coup led by the Iraqi Ba'ath Party brought a new regime to power where it remained until 2003. Before long, anyone who didn't conform to the Ba'athist agenda was attacked. Ba'ath era discourse referred to ethnic groups as qawmiyas, or nationalities in Arabic, continuing a recent trend in Kirkuk. So that was not a new term, but they, they sort of adopted and extended its, its meaning. And the logic of dividing Iraqis in general and Kirkukis in particular into qawmiyas for the purpose of governance relied on the assumption that one's qawmiyah determined one's loyalty to the state. All people who were not Arab were persecuted under this logic, including Turkmens and Assyrians, but Kurds suffered the highest costs in Kirkuk. And in Kirkuk, with its segregation and mutual mistrust among ethnic groups, this method of control produced the deadliest crimes of the Ba'ath regime. It was under the Ba'ath that Iraq nationalized its oil industry in 1972, and the government subjected employees for even the smallest, most menial jobs in the company to surveillance to ensure their loyalty to the Ba'ath party. Job applications for mundane tasks had to pass through a security directorate that would deny a worker access to the oil installations if there was any hint that they were not Ba'athists. Saddam Hussein, who became the president of Iraq in 1979, was explicit about the fact that he saw the integration of Kirkuk into Iraq as crucial to Iraqi unity. As part of the Arabization campaign, the Ba'ath adopted a policy of expelling non-Arabs from Kirkuk and replacing them with Arab settlers from southern Iraq for whom they built new neighborhoods. So notice on this map, um, circa 2003, by the, the end of Ba'ath rule, the way that the city has expanded to the south and southwest, whereas previously it had expanded more toward the north and the northwest. These are the new neighborhoods, these, this massive number of neighborhoods built in the south, built for Arab settlers. Previously, growth in Kirkuk had taken place more in a northern direction, but it's not a coincidence that you see it moving south. The city is literally growing closer to Arab areas and to Baghdad, as though Baghdad is exerting a gravitational pull. In 1986, the Ba'ath government began a genocidal campaign against the Kurds that they called Al-Anfal. The campaign also targeted other non-Arab minority groups living in northeastern Iraq. And the most infamous episode of this campaign was the deadly chemical attack on the village of Halabja in 1988, killing thousands. But what's often overlooked is that the Northern Bureau of the Ba'ath Party was stationed in Kirkuk during this genocide. In other words, the infamous Ali Hassan al-Majid, sometimes called Chemical Ali for planning the gas attacks, planned those attacks from an office in Kirkuk. One of the major camps that held prisoners during al Adfal was also located on the outskirts of Kirkuk. So every person who was brought through that camp and survived it had a memory of being physically brought to and through the city of Kirkuk. After the end of al Anfal, Saddam Hussein's government also targeted Kirkuk's historic citadel, expelling most of its Turkish-speaking residents. In other words, the city became the center of Baghdad's final attempt to violently homogenize and incorporate the multilingual, multicultural northeastern region. So I will conclude here with a few remarks on more recent events. In the wake of the 2003 coalition invasion of Iraq, the dispute over Kirkuk has been in practical terms between the Kurdistan regional government in Iraq's northeast, which has been an autonomous Kurdish region since 1991, and the central government in Baghdad. So most Kurds think Kirkuk should be part of Kurdistan. Most others who are not Kurdish dread the idea of Kurdish control and think Kirkuk should remain aligned with Baghdad.
its situation is extremely tense and will continue to be as long as its status isn't resolved. One of the common features of Kirkuk's political stagnation is the contention that this group's interest is the one that is really inclusive, while that other group is the chauvinistic one. So for instance, while it was under Kurdish control between 2014 and 2017, Kirkuk's Kurdish governor argued that the Kurdish flag represented all Kirkukis. And as you can see here on this slide, at the height of this hubris in early 2017, the provincial council voted to raise Kurdish flags over all of Kirkuk's government buildings on this premise, and they're all taking selfies in front of the Kurdish flag. Then, right after Iraqi troops retook Kirkuk in October 2017, images circulated of people triumphantly taking down the Kurdish flags and replacing them with Iraqi ones. As you see in the image on the right, um, they are unfurling a massive Iraqi flag in the streets. In other images, there were actually videos of people taking the Kurdish down, flag down the flagpole and replacing it with an Iraqi one. As though to say, this is the flag that represents all Kirkukis. Never mind the unfall genocide perpetrated by that very state, this is the inclusive flag, right? So the implication of this back and forth is that we want Kirkuk for legitimate reasons that are good for everybody and you just want it for the oil, for yourselves. And what I'm saying is that acknowledging Kirkuk's painful history of ethnic fault lines and their relationship with oil is a vital initial step toward reconciliation. And one can only hope that a frank reckoning with this history and specifically with the legacy of oil in Kirkuk might play a role in the city's future. This is what my book tries to do. And so that is the brief summary of the book's argument. Okay, wonderful. Um... And I think uh, Sarah has some, uh, some introductory questions uh, for Arbella to have a bit of a back and forth discussion uh, to get us started. Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you, Arbella. Okay, yeah, thank you, Arbella. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, so I was gonna sort of do an introductory thing to the book, but you did it really well, <laughs> obviously, so I'm, I'm not gonna really do that. Um, but I do think, you know, I'll just mention briefly, you know, I think these two main sets of questions um, uh, that you lay out in the preface and the introduction are just, uh, so important for thinking about and rethinking the the, um, the history of modern Iraq, which are, you know, the, the way I'm thinking of these two main sets of questions is the first, and they both challenge really, you know, essential assumptions about Kirkuk. And it's all, you know, it's an important book and a compelling book and also a really brave book because of the, you know, some of the assumptions that you're challenging here. Um, you know, one has to do with um, the assumption that Kirkuk is, is inherently driven by ethnic conflict, right? It's a tinderbox of ethnic tensions, as you say in the in the book. I mean, that's the assumption that's um, what is what is being challenged here. So really thinking about, you know, the book really thinks about, you know, where does that state of contestation come from? It doesn't deny that there is there is a state of ethnic contestation in Kirkuk, but really asks, um, you know, the historical questions about um, about where where it comes from. And um, so it is looking, you know, histor you know, historicizing the construction of ethnicity, specifically the politicization of ethnicity. So that term is used a lot in the book, the politicization of um, ethnic identity. Um, or the ethnic, sorry, the ethnicization of political conflicts. It's a better way to put it, and that's the way you often put it. So I, I um, you know, really appreciate uh, that. And then the second set of questions has to do with oil, right? So the common assumption that, you know, the other common assumption, which is that the city's conflicts are really about oil. Um, and so, you know, the book asks, what does it mean for, for disputes to be really about oil? Um, and again, it does not at all make the argument that they're not really about oil. In lots of ways, it, it says they are really about oil, but they're not just about oil as, as just this material element or commodity, right? They're about um, an oil complex is the kind of analytical term used in the book to think about um, all the different layers, sorry, my phone, um, the different layers in which, um, uh, of life in which, you know, oil affects um, um, Kirkuki, socially, economically, culturally, politically, right? Um, environmentally. Um, so um, I think, you know, considering these sets of questions together, it really offers empirical, analytical, and methodological challenges to existing paradigms for thinking not just about the city of Kirkuk, but about um, the modern history um, of, uh, of Iraq. And of course, this part of this is just uh, decentering Iraqi history from Baghdad, of course. Um, you know, most of the histories written about Iraq and, and Iraq's formation as a modern state, including my own, are, are very Baghdad centered. So, you know, just decentering, um, it's not just though, that's the whole point, is once you decenter Iraqi history from Baghdad, all kinds of other questions start um, opening up about um, Iraqi uh, state formation. And about, so I think what I want to focus on now after actually hearing your comments are, you know, you raise these three, uh, um, these three categories, we look at oil, urbanization, and colonialism, and how these really affected those two sets of questions 
um, that you raise in the beginning. And this time through the book, I mean, we've had this conversation before, but this time uh, going through the book, I um, was actually uh, really wanted to sort of ask you more about this colonialism part of it, the third part of it, because um, it really did struck me, uh, strike me um, in different ways going through the book um, this time. Um, you know, so the role of British colonialism and uh, imperialism, maybe I think you used that term after, you know, after a certain point, maybe after 32. Um, because one, I guess the larger set of, larger question I have is, I think it's really interesting uh, the way in which the book actually puts pressure on or challenges this whole concept of centralization and anti-centralization, even though you look at that as one of the main conflicts, centralization, anti-centralization happening at these different stages in Kirkuk's history, the mandate period, um, there's one set of disputes over that, centralization and decentralization. Um, and then in these, uh, the 1940s, the oil strikes into the 50s, sort of early age of development, centralization, anti-centralization or decentralization is working in different ways. And then of course the bath period, um, again, the question is raised. But this time through the book, I'm really thinking about how um, in some ways the book really challenges that whole paradigm of centralization, decentralization. And so, and, this, and I'm thinking especially about, I think it's um, chapter three, uh, chapter three, oil, or no, maybe it's chapter four, the ideology of urban development, or maybe it's both of those, um, where the British really come back in in a big way, right? And, you know, they're supposed to be gone, right, more or less, right, <laughs> we're in the 1940s, um, you know, 1946 to 58, which is this really central period in your argument in which um, the, the ethnic identities became politicized, or the political tensions became ethnicized, rather. Um, you know, in 1946, we still have this, um, even after, you know, several decades of British colonial intervention and various projects to create ethnic identities, and you specifically say, you know, that didn't happen right away, right? So it's not that British colonial power actually produced these ethnic identities right away in this politicized way. In 1946, there's an oil strike led by communists. It's very non-sectarian, right? We don't have these um, sectarian and ethnic uh, tensions coming up in this politicized way. And then suddenly 1959, it's pretty sudden, um, we do. Um, so I was really struck in that chapter. I think I actually just wanna read a few sentences. Um, if I can find a page, I made a note here somewhere. Um, on page 125. I mean, basically what's happening here is, uh, you know, we have the IPC, the, the Iraq Petroleum Company, which for a while you describe as a semi-sovereign entity, right? It has almost nothing to do with the government of Baghdad. Of course, there are negotiations over the, the percentage of proceeds and all that. But, but you mentioned at one point, like the IPC, like the lead, the, the IPC doesn't even know, like the leading guy in the ICP doesn't even know the name of the governor or something like that. I forget exactly. But basically they have no involvement almost in Iraqi politics. Um, and then, you know, and then they, with the, with the Iraqi state, the central state in Baghdad. Um, and then suddenly, you know, they do, um, and, but also the British government's really involved here. So you talk about the positions of the Iraqi government, the British government, and the IPC assumed in this episode reflected their attitudes toward engagement with Iraqi oil workers. And then you go on to say the British government representatives were keen to take clear public steps to co-opt workers politically, using the company as a key site for their ongoing imperial project in Iraq. And since you did bring this up a few times in your presentation now, I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about that, sort of how your analysis of British, the, the British imperial project you mentioned here, the colonialism in the, um, in, the, in the comments you just gave us, sort of how that fits into your larger analysis and especially how that fits into sort of ideas about centralization, decentralization. Um, or if you want to talk about the IPC instead, <laughs> that's fine too. But, but sort of a question about, um, about centralization here. And maybe I'll just also, um, I don't want to take a lot of time here, um, but, uh, this whole concept of development too, which is totally related. So the British government, I think this, this, this is my notes from your talk just now, um, that the British government, the Iraqi government and the IPC, um, after the 46 strike, now they all get together in different ways to lead this, these sort of development projects that come out of that. Um, I, I have a few questions about, about sort of the development um, in this 46 to 58, 59 period. Um, First of all, what, I, guess, I guess maybe I'll, I'll stick to two questions. One, what does it mean that development was focusing on producing a middle class? Like usually when we think of sort of the global post-war development apparatus emerging in this time period, it's really targeting the poor, right? The workers and other economically marginalized people. Like what did it mean to, to be calling development projects in response to a strike um, 
but then focused on creating a middle class. If you could say a little bit more about that and sort of how this is a development project responding to a strike that's really focusing on the middle class. Is there anything more to kind of say about that or draw out about that? Um, and then relatedly, this idea of a, the strike being a disaster or, or the disastrous end of the strike, which of course it was because you know they opened fired and, and killed several workers. But, and, but in some ways, the workers seem to have gotten a lot of what they wanted, right? There was a wage increase and then the housing schemes they had originally proposed, it sounded like. Um, so in, you know, in what ways was the strike itself sort of effective um, or was it just completely co-opted by this then shift to the middle class? So say a little bit more about what you mean by development or development projects um, in this post uh, strike moment. Maybe I'll just stop there. You can respond to whatever you want or not, or we could just take questions. Yeah, I can respond briefly um, to your, there, there's a lot of questions there, um, yeah. <laughs> but I can respond briefly and then, um, you know, we can open it up to the, the broader audience. Um, so starting with colonialism and imperialism in this work, it's, I think, always a little bit fraught to write about colonial and imperial influence when you're writing about ethnic conflict in a colonized or formerly colonized part of the world, because I feel like a lot of those works in Middle Eastern history, African history, probably other parts of the world too that I'm, I'm less familiar with, start with, um, you know, usually a scholar pushing back against the idea that these identities are primordial. And so maybe the simplistic version of that argument is everybody was fine. These identities weren't really political at all. They didn't, they barely existed. And then, um, you know, this colonial entity, the British, the French, whoever it is, came in and like created these groups. They created the concept of caste or they created the concept of ethnicity or they created something. And then these people have been riven by conflict ever since. And it's because of the colonialists who came in and divided them, right? Um, then the pushback against that is, isn't that a little simplistic and doesn't it deny agency to the people who, you know, have these identities and doesn't it deny the, the fact that these identities actually have very long histories, particularly in the case of groups who are indigenous to this region for, for many, many centuries and millennia even, um, isn't that problematic to suggest that colonial entities just sort of created this conflict and that, that like point counterpoint, I think preoccupies a lot of this literature. And so I had to, um, find ways to kind of step around that very um, like difficult terrain. Um, so what you see as far as the role of the British here, I think is, is a couple things. Um, one is that British imperial influence continues after the end of the mandate through the IPC, which you alluded to in your, in your response to my remarks. Um, so even after the end of the mandate, it's not that British colonial officials just sort of pack up and go home. It's some of the very same people continuously staying in Kirkuk and serving in um, a consulate there whose um, interests, at least formally, were supposed to like issue visas and kind of deal with consular affairs with people working for the oil company. But it continued to be a site of, you know, semi-colonial or imperial influence. If you look at, you know, the documentation continuously through the colonial office and the foreign office, you know, uh, files um, in Kirkuk, you, you see that this consulate and petroleum company itself are basically operating as these kinds of like sites of, of direct British influence, even though the, the company was a private entity. Of course, it also had its own private interests and in some ways was sovereign and separate from um, the British government as well. I mean, formally speaking, it was separate, but even in this um, sense of being a, a site of imperialism, it wasn't an unproblematic one or, or a, a simple one. So the oil com company really has its own infrastructure, its own police force, its own diplomatic interests. It's not necessarily very good at um, you know, pursuing them as evidenced by the fact that the, the head of the IPC didn't know the Kirkuk governor. Um, but it, it continues to be a kind of um, like semi-private but separate site of, um, of British colonial and imperial, eventually we might more broadly call it imperial influence. Um, and then as far as the role that this plays in ethnic um, politicization of ethnicity, one of the things that we have to contend with carefully, I think, um, bearing in mind the debate that I just outlined, um, is the fact that some of the vocabulary of Kirkuk's racial groups and the idea that those racial, and eventually they, they use words that they translate as ethnic um, groups, have distinct political interests is in part borrowed from British and League of Nations language dating back to the 1920s. I, I don't want to go so far as to say that 
they created that tendency among the population, but there's an unmistakable adoption of rubrics that you first see in those kinds of colonial um, documents. So uh, looking at, for example, the League of Nations report resolving the Mosul Vilayet dispute in 1926, um, that report divides Kirkukis into this four-part taxonomy of Kurdish Turkish, they said they did not use the word Turkmen at the time, Arab and Christian, not using the word Assyrian, but Christian. Um, and that four part taxonomy is still with us. Like there, there's, it's unmistakable that to some extent that ended up shaping politics going forward. So it's a little bit tricky sometimes to pin down the, the role of colonialism here, but it's definitely there. You can see the sort of traces of it through time, even after the British mandate ends. As far as um, the question of development, that 1946 to 1958 period is really, really interesting in Kirkuk. Um, and you asked what it means that the development projects focused on producing a middle class because globally, so many development projects focused on um, raising people out of poverty, including um, some of the, the people who they brought into Kirkuk. I, you know, for, for time, I obviously cut a lot of content, but um, one of the people commissioned by the Iraqi government to work on urban development in Iraq generally in Kirkuk in particular was um, Konstantinos Doxiadis, um, this Greek urban planner who was known for these plans that he sold as raising people out of poverty through quote unquote scientific urban development, um, which was actually a, a kind of, um, you know, or tactics of urban control for a lot of these, these governments, these developing um, states, but uh, what was sold as this kind of like apolitical scientific, um, you know, better life through science sort of thing to, to raise people out of poverty. So that discourse was there. And yet, if we look at um, what was actually happening in Kirkuk, what the plans actually looked like, the focus was on building housing for the contract employees of the Iraq Petroleum Company. So in other words, the ones who already knew a little English, who are actually being paid a monthly wage or a salary, not the people working in the fields for a daily wage. Um, the concern was not so much with helping them. I have a, I'm not sure that I have a, a good answer to the why implied in that question. Why was it that way in Kirkuk versus other places? And I think that this actually opens up an interesting comparison that I hadn't really thought of until you brought this up. Um, if, if somebody wanted to think about this comparatively, like if, if anyone in the audience is working on development projects in other parts of Iraq or another part of the world, anywhere else, Asia, Africa, Latin America, you know, is there somewhere else where we see this tendency to want to um, focus on the middle class versus the poor and what, what might that mean? I'm not sure I have a good answer to that question. It's an interesting question, but it's unmistakably there. Um, one thing I would just bring up is that the um, housing scheme for Iraq Petroleum Company employees, and you saw a photo of this man standing in front of his, his house that he now owns under the home ownership scheme, was unmistakably intended as an anti-communist measure. The idea explicitly stated in the conception of that, um, that housing scheme was that you would turn people into capitalists if you made them property owners. So that was part of the thinking, I think, was that um, it, it was to try to counter the influence of the Iraqi Communist Party, which was very powerful in Iraq at the time. Um, and in the case of the disastrous end of the strike, and you've suggested that the strike was somewhat successful, it, it was um, in part because um, they felt themselves pressured to respond to it with things like housing and um, wage increases to some extent. It, it benefited some people and not, not everyone who um, worked for the company. Um, so I, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that answers the last question or if there's an, another dimension to that. No, that's good. We could open yeah. it up, I think. Yeah. Sure, yeah, thank it's you. probably a good time to open it up. Yeah, okay, great. Um, thank you so much, that was wonderful. So I do have two questions already from audience members. Um, and if I don't get a few more and we still have some uh, remaining time, I will will attempt to unmute some mics and uh, if people want to ask their questions um, directly. But I do have a question from Peter Wine, who is, mm -hmm. uh, I believe, a history professor at, at the University of Maryland. Uh, his question is about the role of Islamist actors in the history of Kirkuk. He says they're mostly absent in the part of modern Iraqi historiography that does not involve Shi'i Muslims. Considering the prominent role of the Muslim Brotherhood political mobilization in Egypt, Syria, and other places at the time, I find this astonishing. Do they play a role in your sources? 
Um, so I've, I've just um, moved back to this slide. Um, hello, Peter. Thank you for coming, by the way. I'm glad you're here. Um, the role of Islamist actors. This is really interesting. So um, what I'm going to say in response to that question is I have very little information about it, in part because there was very little in my sources, but there were intriguing moments of like, whoa, what is... Um, where did that come from? Uh, there'll just be a mention of something. So I, I go back to this slide because the, um, the image that you see here on the left is of a public library in Kirkuk, but I believe it was the same source or a contemporaneous source. I, I don't have my, my primary sources in front of me. I'd have to go back to my scanned PDFs, but um, somewhere in here, I remember seeing a reference to a Muslim Brotherhood library in Kirkuk, like a private library owned by the Muslim Brotherhood and being like, what? And then I never saw a reference to that again. So it's, it's these kinds of like fleeting things where you can see that the Muslim Brotherhood, like Sunni Islamism had a, a presence in Iraq for sure, but it's, um, it's hard to figure out um, like what was going on in Kirkuk as far as Islamist influence. All I can say is that um, what I've seen suggests that it was not a dominant force until post 2003 and even post 2003, it's not dominant, but it's present. Um, but prior to that, you just see sort of fleeting mentions of it. It's, it's not absent. It is there. Um, it is inherently interesting, though, that some of the sectarian Islamic politics that you see in other parts of the country are not terribly salient in Kirkuk. And there are Sunni and Shia people in Kirkuk, both, right? There are Sunni and Shia Turkmens. There are Sunni and Shia Kurds. Um, Kirkuk itself, the city, is overwhelmingly Sunni um, prior, prior to um, the resettlement of Arabs there. So prior to um, Saddam Hussein's regime, um, it was overwhelmingly Sunni. And um, in some very early 20th century sources, we get a sense of um, competition between different Sufi orders um, that were connected to different um, influential Kurdish families in Kirkuk. And then um, like a certain family would be the patron of a certain Sufi shrine. And then there would be sort of um, like little mini turf wars and influence wars over that sort of in the late Ottoman era. Um, I'm not an Ottomanist and I'd love to know more about exactly what was going on in that regard in the late 19th and early 20th century. I do know that pretty quickly after 1918, once um, allied troops take Kirkuk at the end of World War I, that particular um, mode of political competition almost seems to vanish because I just don't see references to it after 1918. Um, so as far as like confessional identity, religious subjectivity, and then eventually Islamist movements, it's the, you know, kind of in the background, like occasionally you see mentions of it, it's barely there. Post 2003, um, so a lot of the Arabs who were moved to Kirkuk in the Ba'ath era were Shia. So you have a larger Shia population building in Kirkuk. And then post 2003, you start to see things like the opening of an Iranian cultural center in Kirkuk. And all of a sudden, like, you know, Iran has a foothold there the way they do in other parts of the country. And Shia Islamists, have, you know, who are, of course, ascendant politically in Baghdad and other parts of the country now suddenly have this presence in Kirkuk. Um, but that's a very new trend. And even now, it is not a dominant one. My, my sense is that it is not something that um, really has transformed Kirkuk's politics and sort of the, the fault lines of its political disputes, but it's there. It's kind of in the mix now as one of the many things going on. Thank you. Uh, Peter, do you have a follow-up or go into oh, the next you. question? Okay, wonderful, thanks. Um, I, I, I will unmute folks if, uh, if they want to have a quick follow-up to the, their uh, question that they posed. The second question is from Mahmoud Alewa. Um, what was the position of Assyrians in Kirkuk politically during the period of the monarchy and later revolutionary <laughs> period in the Republic when Abdul Karim al-Qasim was prime minister? Great. Um, so yeah, the question is about Assyrians in Kirkuk. Really, really interesting question as well. One of the many things that I try to touch on in the book that sort of got, got cut for um, time in the remarks. So, okay, so where do we start? So there's a divide in the Assyrian community in Kirkuk between those who are who had a longer standing history in the city prior to World War I and those who moved there as refugees, typically from other areas to the north, often in, from, you know, Hakkari, you know, other areas where they had been um, displaced by the genocide of World War I um, and then eventually ended up in, in Iraq and then some of them ended up in Kirkuk and, and settled there. Later on, many Assyrians came to work for the oil company, for the IPC. So they move into Kirkuk from other places, you know, like through, through the 20th century. The 
people who were in that broader, um, I, I end up using the term Caldo Assyrian a lot in my book, so that from, from that sort of broader umbrella category who were native to Kirkuk, often were members of the Chaldean Catholic Church, self-identified as Chaldean, in many cases were actually native speakers of Turkish. Um, and in, in some sources, you even see them referred to as like Turkmens at the same time that they're referred to as Chaldeans. So their positionality is, is um, sort of unique here um, and very different from that of, let's say, recently displaced refugees from the north who did not speak Turkish, um, who only spoke the Assyrian language, also known as Neo-Aramaic, um, and were in a very different position relative to power. And I, I um, differentiate between these things because there was tension between these groups and a very different relationship with British authority initially. So in the monarchy era, in the mandate era, um, and in the monarchy era, the um, Assyrians in Kirkuk were often closer to the British establishment, for better or for worse. And then the um, people who self-identified as Chaldean often, um, you know, portrayed themselves as distinct from that. Um, so, but at the same time, in terms of their political position relative to Muslims in the city, often Muslims did not make that distinction. And um, one example of this comes up in an episode in 1924, in which Assyrian forces, known as the Assyrian levies, who were maintaining security in Kirkuk on behalf of the British, um, opened fire on the population in the center of the city after they had been harassed in, in many ways and they just started killing civilians. And um, the local, the one prominent local Chaldean who was um, testifying in court after this incident um, tried very hard, like took great pains to separate himself from the Assyrians, but there was retaliation against the local Chaldean population by the Muslim population the day after that um, massacre by the levies, where they attacked and killed um, Chaldeans in their homes and their businesses. So a lot of times that distinction actually wasn't salient, and then at times it was. There was this kind of intra-communal conflict within that um, community. So that, that's a complicated and kind of all over the place answer to your question, but it, in a way what I'm saying is that there wasn't a single position of Assyrians under the monarchy that um, historians who look exclusively at, let's say, the Assyrian levies might conclude that, oh, the Assyrians were like agents of the British, but um, that isn't really true in Kirkuk, and we actually see um, different tendencies. And then moving forward past the monarchy, we see Assyrians involved in basically every political movement in Iraq. There were um, Assyrians in Kirkuk who were members of the Communist Party, who were you know, deeply involved in that strike in 46. Um, and they, they end up aligning with basically every major political faction after um, 1958. But ultimately, what becomes important more and more in the context of Arabization is not how they align politically. And there were Assyrian Ba'athists too. Um, it's, it's not so much how they align politically as their subjectivity as non-Arabs, you know, ends up being a liability and they end up being caught up in a lot of the same ethnic cleansing um, campaigns that targeted Kurds and Turkmens as well, um, with Kurds bearing the highest costs of those in Kirkuk. Okay, great. Um, wonderful. The next question we have is from Rahul. Um, he says, I was curious to know if Arbella came across any soft power exercises that the colonial powers used in order to increase their influence over Kirkuk. Something along the lines of the British Council, the Alliance Francaise, et cetera, giving scholarships to Kirkuk students, uh, something along those lines. Great question. Yeah, so um, the British Council was present in Kirkuk, had an office there, um, and held um, English classes and showed films. Um, and in addition to the British Council, um, the United States actually had a consulate in Kirkuk in um, the 1950s that grew out of a United States Information Agency office. So it actually started as a soft power exercise. It started as, um, you know, post-1946, you know, oh my God, there's communists in Kirkuk, what do we do? So the USIA opens um, an office in Kirkuk to show people like films about the United States and about how nice it is to live under capitalism. And um, eventually this turns into a consulate. They give the guy who was running the USIA office consular authority to like issue visas and, and things like that. And um, this, by the way, I, I, I specify all this because it took me forever to find the files from that consulate um, in the US National Archives because they were not categorized as a consulate. And it took a long time to figure that out. And eventually I figured out it was a USIA office that became a consulate. Um, so the US, and the British really ramped up those kinds of soft power um, 
uh, activities after 1946. That's where you really see that happening and then it kind of abruptly comes to an end after 1958. But so it happens in that development period that Sarah isolated um, in particular. That's where you really see that um, very prominently. And um, a lot of these were, uh, um, the, the Iraq Petroleum Company itself had some of this too. So they, you mentioned scholarships, they had educational schemes for, for workers um, to, in some cases, send them to Britain for an education, in some cases, train them in little apprenticeships to do sort of um, like practical, vocational, um, you know, uh, handiwork type of work in, um, in the IPC in Kirkuk. And um, so there, there was a lot of that, a lot of soft power um, programming that um, I do go over in chapter four of the actual book in, in much more detail. And it was particularly in that 1946 to 1958 period. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I have a, a question from Denan Twil Um In other parts of Iraq, ethnicity and tribal belonging is quite fluid. What is it that makes Kirkuk so special? Mm -hmm. Which is a much more than a five minute answer, I think, but <laughs> probably as lengthy as your entire book, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what I would say is that a lot of these axes of identity, um, they, they can be fluid. I, I think the way that I would define them, even in other parts of Iraq, is that they are important to people's experience and political position and their sort of social position, but they recede into the background and they're not politically salient. Um, they can be fluid in the sense that they change, but that's a little bit different than saying that they're salient or not. Um, so yes, th there was some fluidity between like, um, are you Chaldean or are you Assyrian? Are you Turkish or Turkmen? There's a lot of fluidity between those terms that I go over more in the book itself. Um, but in, in addition to fluidity, there's just the question of, does it matter that I am a Turkmen or I am an Assyrian or whatever in this, in this situation in 1920 versus does it matter in 1950, 1960, 1970? And over time it does. Um, and as it matters more and more, those identities tend to solidify as political practices and become very pervasive as political practices. Um, if I wanted to give the, the like less than five minute answer of, of why is Kirkuk so special, you know, it has to do with oil, right? It has to do with the um, fragmented city that oil built and the high stakes that it created and the fact that um, the development of an oil industry is dependent on um, foreign technology and influence and ends up developing in a colonial context just about everywhere in the Middle East where it develops. Um, so it creates power differentials wherever it occurs. It, it is not something that is in any way democratic or collectively owned or sort of um, raising people out of poverty equally. It actually does the opposite and it tends to segregate people. It tends to lead to vast economic inequality. And a, a lot of that has to do with the nature of how it is developed, how it's extracted, how it's sold on the global market. Um, that is the short answer to that question. But of course, it's, it's a little bigger than that. Right. Um, and then we have, I think, time for this, just this one last question, because we do want to um, try to respect everyone's time and, and uh, cut off at 4.30. So um, this is from Gabrielle Young. Mm -hmm. And um, I chose the second half of your question, Gabriel. I hope that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, she asks, do you get the sense that there's a lot of writing from people in Baghdad in the 50s and 60s making claims to the oil of Kirkuk as generally Iraqi rather than specifically local oil? Um, whether these are, are these economists that are making these claims? Are these, uh, I, I, she says ICP, um, I think it's IPC, right? And now she Iraqi Petroleum Corporation. Are these uh, IPC figures? Are they Baathists, uh, et cetera? The question could, it could be ICP or IPC, because ICP is the Iraqi Communist Party, which is a, a, um, a abbreviation that I have avoided using that because I sense. say IPC so much, so I never say ICP, but I do, I do know what you mean. Okay, so, so like, what is, what is the nature of oil? Is it characterized as Iraqi? Who's writing this stuff? Um, so people from Kirkuk, like the, I, I've got this slide up, so it's sort of the perfect example. These two authors you see cited here, Aga and Mustafa, um, writing this book about Kirkuk in 1957. We're very much writing about it as a Kirkuk-y thing, but that's the exception. So for the most part, um, oil, which at that time was mostly coming out of Kirkuk, was claimed very much as an Iraqi resource. 
Um, I, I'm sure Gabriel knows that later in the 20th century, and certainly today in the 21st century, most Iraqi oil actually comes out of Basra and the, the southern region. But as of this time, um, that was not the case. Kirkuk was really where almost all the oil was, was coming from at that point. And yet, in Iraqi discourse, it was not about it, it was not something local, right? It was it was very much seen as like the pride of Iraq and and the the you know engine of our modernization as Iraqis, but not really something that was attributed to the provinces. Um, as far as who's writing these things, um, if the people writing them were broadly sympathetic to or aligned with the Iraqi government or the British establishment, that's where you get the discourse of um, oil as a positive force. And what I've found is that if communists were writing about it, or um, let's say Turkmen nationalists, for example, writing like Turkish poetry about oil, it was always written about as a, an imperialist force. So it was not seen as something positive by people outside of the kind of elite and the establishment but a lot of people were writing about it. Perfect, wonderful, we're, we're exactly on time. So <laughs> I know people get Zoom fatigue a lot nowadays and staring at a screen all day even more than we did under normal circumstances can be taxing on everyone. So um, I wanna thank you Arbella so much, this was really wonderful. And thank you also Sarah for participating and thank you everyone for your wonderful questions. Um, and hopefully we'll have another uh, virtual event coming up soon, if not uh, over the summer to keep us all uh, in shape then uh, starting back again in the fall. Thank you all so much and uh, we'll be signing off. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you.